Speech Zone, and welcome to the second show of the year. And uh, like we started last time, I'm doing a little section called Bill's Photos, and I've taken a few photos this week, and I thought I'd quickly show them to you. This is why we do the political stuff, so we can do this other stuff that we really like to do. So go ahead and put the first one up. Yeah, now, it was really cloudy the first day I went out there this week. You can't even see the Columbia River behind me. But, uh, yeah, I, this thing doesn't work from there. Go, the next one. So, uh, at sunset, I went to Forest Lake, which is a, a lake from the uh, Vanport Flood area. It's now a, a wet zone, a uh, wetland for ducks and other wildlife. And uh, go ahead and switch to the next one. This is a rare one. Uh, I think it's called a red hawk, but I'm not sure. If, I'll have to check the book. But very rare. In 10 years, I've only seen him two or three times. So, uh, but he's a, he's a beautiful bird. Now, this is another example. This is across the lake. There was a great blue heron surrounded by a whole bunch of geese. They're really unusual. They didn't seem to care about each other. Go to the next one. Yeah. Here's a little duck that I kind of liked. I like the colors reflecting the sky and the clouds. I don't know what type of duck that is. I will find out. I'm not an Audubon guy, but I uh, probably will join up eventually. Go ahead and hit the next one. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, this is a good one. This is uh, the sunset is really getting colorful. And so I try to find the reflection on the lake and the ducks cooperated with me. Go ahead and you know, see what this is a really nice example of how the ducks came right over where I could get a good picture of them. And there they are close up. And I guess we're back here. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so basically that's it. And you know, I don't always have world-class pictures when I go out, but uh, oftentimes I do. It's becoming more and more frequent. Digital is, uh, you know, it allows you to just keep shooting until your finger gets tired and you're bound to get at least one good one that way. Well, we're going to jump right into the more serious side of things now. Um, <clears throat> again, this is the lady that calls herself the resident, and she's going to give you a brief history of the United States suppressing protest. Yeah, we're supposed to have the right to protest it. It's supposed to be guaranteed in the Constitution, but in reality every time there's a protest we smash it go ahead and play <laughs> people have been protesting against police brutality. The sheer numbers of protesters has been astounding. Americans have been acting like it's 1968, organizing and actually being active about demanding civil rights. So now might be a good time to remember that the government has a long history of shutting down protests in some really crazy ways. In 1968, the Democratic National Convention was being held in Chicago, and people came out to protest the Vietnam War in droves. The mayor called in 27,000 police, state, and federal agents. They beat the crap out of protesters and journalists. They used tear gas and batons. More than 1,000 people were treated for injuries. But that was nothing compared to how the government shut down the war protest at Kent State. In May of 1968, the National Guard arrived on campus, and the governor of Ohio vowed that the government was going to eradicate the problem, meaning eradicate the protest. After using tear gas to break up the crowds, National Guardsmen opened fire on protesters, killing four and injuring nine. Then 30 years later, in 1999, protesters gathered in what's become known as the Battle in Seattle. Citizens gathered to protest the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference and its globalization movement. Police used tear gas, rubber bullets, and pepper spray. And they forcibly arrested hundreds and then held them for days in order to squelch the protests. 
And then, of course, there's the Occupy movement. Across the nation, protests were systematically shut down by the government. Protesters were pepper sprayed. The corporate media belittled the entire movement. Tons of arrests were made. The FBI even knew of and did nothing about plans to murder Occupy leaders by sniper rifle. The government did everything they could to shut down Occupy protests in seriously screwed up ways. And now again, people just protested across the country. And this time, it's been peaceful and organized with a clear, rational demand of ending the brutality of our militarized police. The government must have been brainstorming ways to stop it. The police had their normal pepper sprays and military-grade LRADs and whatnot, but people still protested. At the height of the protesting, the Senate released their torture report that had no other business coming out when it did, so maybe that was their way of trying to distract everyone from protesting. Who knows what they were thinking? All I know for sure is that with such a long history of squelching protests, watching pretty much the entire country come together like it just did must have been torture for the government to watch. Tonight, let's talk about that. Okay, there. Sorry, I didn't have my mic plugged in. Um, okay, so now we're going to start bringing you up to date on some of the past history, the false flag history of the United States. Uh, not the obvious ones like, oh, Northwoods or uh, Gulf of Tonkin or something like that. But let's talk about the 1993 World Trade Center bombing that was instigated by the FBI not by some foreign group of terrorists. And remember I played the tapes that came from the uh, trial? Um, Ahmad Salam, the informant, said, hey, we're using real explosives. What's with that? And he says, well, you, you can't make them be good, is what the FBI handler asked. We're going to go ahead and play this. It's about 20 minutes, and this will blow your mind if you really don't know much about it. 1993. Always out in the field. I'll still go out in the field occasionally, like Fat Albert. All right, we'll be back with our guest. Stay with us. Back in 1993, right after the first World Trade Center attack, I remember listening to local talk radio where a talk show host was discussing Imad Salem, the FBI informant, the former Egyptian military colonel who went undercover for the FBI and infiltrated the first Al-Qaeda cell on American soil in New York City during the 93 World Trade Center bombing. He also penetrated the headquarters of Al-Qaeda in America under the leadership of the blind sheik Omar Abdel Rahman and the underground terrorist cell who was planning to blow up the landmarks in New York City and became the government star witness in the Day of the Terror trial. He is the author of Undercover, The Untold Story of Al-Qaeda, the FBI, and the CIA in America, imadsalem.org. I've read the book. It came in a few weeks ago. Extremely powerful information. Now, folks, we're going to recap today in the next 50-something minutes what happened in 93. He sent a lot of photos and, and clips for TV viewers. For radio listeners, you can go to infowars.com forward slash show and find the free video feed. Or by tomorrow, we'll have an archive of this on the front page of prisonplanet.com and infowars.com. But this guy is a patriot for freedom. Now, he'd worked in intelligence operations, fought extremists in the Middle East, Egypt, one of our biggest allies, as you know, betrayed, set up, turned over to radicals, and the military came in and ousted them. It's a destabilization program that's going on. Well, he came over here when Egypt was one of our staunchest allies and helped infiltrate these groups. And it even came out in the New York Times. I'm going to show TV viewers this. Radio listeners can look it up. This is from October 28th, 93. Tapes depict proposal to thwart bomb used in Trade Center Blast. And Mr. Salem, he 
ju just to give you a boil down, and then he'll say it in his own words and, and, and correct areas that I don't get exactly right. But I made a film about this. I've been covering this since right after it happened. This is one of the reasons I heard a local talk show host talking about it, went and bought the New York Times. Back then, you had to go to a newspaper shop to find them. Read it. Couldn't believe the FBI would basically tell him to build the bomb, give him real detonators, and then tell him, let it go a forward, and then he tried to stop it. That was a game changer for me. Then we saw Waco and that cover-up, and Oklahoma City, which was clearly another false flag. That's why I got on air. It took me two years to get on air. I got on air in 95. So Mr. Salem's story to show how a rock leaves big ripples in a pond is one of the things that triggered his courage is one of the things that triggered this broadcast being on air today and being the number one place in the world, hands down, exposing the fact of Operation Gladio, other operations of provocateur terror and an attempt to radicalize liberal groups, conservative groups, Islamic groups, you name it, to discredit them. Now, that's my take on it. Uh, Ahmad Salem can give it to you in his take, but Colonel, we appreciate you coming on. This is an amazing uh, chance to talk to you. Your book is just amazing. I got so much even more insight. Of course, uh, you tried to stop them. They tried to then set you up. I know you then recorded them, and so we're able to get a settlement. Thank God you did that because you're one of the only people on the inside to ever get out alive who exposes a false flag. So you've got the floor, sir, to recap 1993. And then I know you want to move forward and talk about ISIS, about Obama, about Al-Qaeda in America. You've got some incredible intel for us today. So God bless you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Alex, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to give me the platform to talk about the experience I have been through since 1990 with the FBI when I started to do covert operation against the Russian with the New York office for the Russian squad. Um, at that time, I was employed in uh, Manhattan in a hotel, and I was a chief engineer slash head of security. And uh, I was approached by one of the FBI agents in the counterterrorism uh, in the uh, Russian squad, and she requested my cooperation. And it was... Uh, a blessing and uh, a great deal of ownership for me to assist the FBI to infiltrate this group of Russians. And this operation lasted, I would say, six to eight months. And uh, after that, uh, Nancy Floyd, the FBI agent who did recruit me to do that operation, moved me to the INS. I did another operation covertly with the INS that resulted into 72 arrests, and then I moved into the terrorist squad. And that's at the beginning of my involvement with the JTTF, which is the Joint Terrorist Task Force, the New York office. And um, there is a few things I would like to correct it, that so many news outlets reported that I I went to the FBI, I knocked the door, I said I have information. That's a false information. Um, actually, the FBI came to my office in the hotel at that time and requested my cooperation, and I was completely honored to do it with no return or no payment or no nothing because I did my job as a U.S. citizen. And so you I did it for honor and justice? Absolutely. Not a penny for the first six months and then another three months for the INS. And then I started with the terrorist squad. At that time, it was assassination in Manhattan for a Jewish rabbi, his name is Nair Kahana, by uh, an Arab person. And the FBI didn't have enough information about what's going on inside this group. They asked me to go inside, and I did. And I became a member of El Sayyid Nusir, which is the assassin of Nair Kahana, the, his uh, 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 group of raising fundraising and uh, collecting money to support his defense, and he was being defended by um, a, a Jewish lawyer. His name is William Kanzler. He is no longer with us now. He passed away. However, Said Nusser was acquitted in the first part, but because of the information I provided, 
Uh, I went to say no sir in prison in yeah in in in, in, um, in Attica and in Rikers Island and um, he told me that he did do the assassination and he described it to me in details how he did it because I was one of the insider at that time and he thought that I am a fanatic as well and I uh, I am going for the assassination of human beings which I don't. Uh, no matter what the agreement or disagreement with somebody else, he's a human being, I have no rights to take his life. But that was a fatwa from the blind sheikh, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Um, it came a day during my infiltration to Sayyid Nusir's group, I was approached by one of the Joint Terrorist Task Force Special Agent John Antisev, and he showed me a newspaper picture for the blind sheikh. He said, do you know this person? I said, yes, this is Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman who assassinated my president, Anwar Sadat. At that time, I was still in the service in the Egyptian military, and I was present during the parade President Sadat was assassinated in. And uh, I said, uh, Asian John told me that this man is in New Jersey. I said, my God. How did he came to New Jersey? He said, well, that's unknown at this time. But uh, what do you think? I said, I think he is a very dangerous man. This man, wherever he go, people drop dead. And he is on the terrorist list. How did this man came into America? Lo and behold, he said, can you approach him? I did approach the blind sheikh. And I get very close to him. Um, uh, 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 covertly, of course, and then he asked me to go on a trip with him for fundraising into Detroit. At that time, the FBI provided me with a van. Uh, that van was electronically bugged through uh, a certain chopper. Uh, they, they, they have their way of recording the information, but during our trip from New York to Detroit, the blind sheikh asked me, I heard that you are retired from special ops in Egypt. I said, yes, sir. Okay, do you, are, uh, do you know how to shoot? Uh, yes, sir, of course. Are you a sharp shooter? I said, yes. He said, okay, if you wanted to repent from serving an infidel government, then you need to assassinate President Hosni Mubarak. At that time, Mubarak was coming the next Wednesday. It was shocking for me to have a straight order from the blind sheikh uh, uh, because he got the whiff first from his followers that I'm collecting money for Sayyid Nasser. I'm one of the close people that the Nasser group, and that's why he attempted to give me that order. And of course, all of that's being recorded on tapes. I said, okay, I think that's a good idea. I did not decline. And I made a point to bring that to the attention of my handlers at that time, which is Special Agent John Antisev and uh, uh, Detective Louis Napoli from the terrorist squad in the New York office. We came back from Detroit and uh, the blind sheikh requested me to visit Said Nusser in Attica. I went to visit him in Attica. He gives me the order to build a bomb. Do you know how to build a bomb? I said, of course, um, it's special ops. He said, okay, I would like you to build a bomb and uh, kidnap uh, Henry Kissinger and Judge uh, Duffy, who ruled against him in this case. And if you can kidnap an FBI agent, that would be great. So you can bargain to release me. I said, okay, Sheikh, that's a good idea and i went back i reported that to my handlers from this point on i start to ask said no sir in the next visit how am i going to build the bombs i don't have materials i don't know what to do and that's as per the instructions i was instructed by my handlers in the jttf not to dictate or not to suggest targets or not to suggest bombings but I always ask open in question. And my open in questions, how am I going to build the bomb? I don't have material. 
Said Nusir described to me where to go in Canal Street, what street, what is the name of the store, where to buy the fuse, where to buy the explosives. I said, great. I came back from Attica, I went to Canal Street, I bought the fuse, and I went to my handlers in the bureau. At that time, they said, it is getting very serious, we have to bring you up to the ASAP. The ASAC and the FBI means assistant special agent in charge. His name is Carson Danbar, and he is in charge of the counterterrorism in the New York office at the time. I said, Sayyid Nusir requested from me to build a bomb, told me where to get the materials. Here is the fuse. I got it, and now I need to know what to do. He said, I got to put you on the box. I said, what do you mean box? Can I put you on a polygraph? Well, I have been working with you guys almost for a year now with the Russian squad, with the, with the INS, with the Nusir assassination. And now you're coming to tell me you want to polygraph me? You have no trust? He said, no. Put me in the polygraph is not going to get a result, Mr. Carson. He said, why, Salem? I said, because I know how to fool the machine. He said, I don't care. Put him on a box. They got an examiner, put me on the box, and the conclusion came that unconclusive result. So I went to Mr. Dan, but I said, I told you so. He said, I don't care. Put him on another examiner for another polygraph. I went for the second polygraph, came unconclusive. He called Washington headquarters for the FBI, brought the head of the examiners from Washington to, to conduct the test by himself, so it will not be uh, unconclusive as usual. The gentleman who came from the headquarter rubbed me wrong and he conducted a test and I proved him that I can fool his machine. And I'm being frank about it because I have nothing to hide. Yet he came that uh, it is unconclusive, but his feeling is that I am deceptive. And that became a personal uh, 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 disagreement between me and the examiner. This is the third exam in one week, and it came unconclusive. But once he go to Washington, I became deceptive. I said, I really sure. Don't and just to be clear, polygraphs are now basically not admissible because all you've got to do is stay upset the entire time at every question, and then it's just all over the map. There's other ways to beat them. They're only there to fool people into thinking that they know you're lying. They do exactly. have some brain scans now that are more accurate, but even those uh, are fraudulent. It's a quack machine so that they can basically demonize whoever they want. But regardless, your whole story has come out in the Washington Post, New York Times. What happened to you was recorded coming up. You've been proven to be accurate and correct. I think the polygraph thing is interesting, but not that important in the final equation. And we have Ahmad Salem, the former Egyptian military colonel, worked in intelligence, you name it, became a citizen, moved to the U.S., began working with the FBI, infiltrating very dangerous uh, Russian-type assassination groups, then infiltrating uh, radical Islamic groups that were assassinating people, if you just tuned in. Uh, again, the New York Times tapes to pick proposal to thwart bomb used in Trade Center blast. He's building up to win. Okay, they've built the bomb. They're, they're real terrorists. Now let's bust them, and the FBI basically lets it go forward. Uh, continue telling the rest of the story. Then I want to move forward to, to the intel that's really important. Okay. Uh, because, uh, I mean, your take on ISIS, Obama, the radicalization, all the things that are happening. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Salem. Yes, sir. Uh, it came to the point that Mr. Carson Dunbar started to like, dislike me personally, that there is three examiners come unconclusive. He insists that I wear a wire. I was working as an intelligence gathering uh, asset, as they described it, and I never had intention to testify and become a star witness and all of the above. But at that moment, if I wear a wire, as he requested, I will be obligated, I will become a character witness and I will be obligated to testify in an open court. And at that time, I have a family, I have a wife, I have two children. I don't want to jeopardize their life by open, uh, uh, disclosing my, my covert work. 
Uh, Mr. Dambar insists, I said, I'm willing to put the, to wear the wire and bring you the information on that tape that Mr. Nusir asked me to build the bomb, if that's what you're concerned about, but I don't testify in court. He said, no, then go home. I said, go home. The people asking me to build the bomb, you're telling me, and I'm the only one who is giving you ears and eyes inside the cell, you tell me, go home? He said, yes, go home. I said, okay. And I told the three agents who are standing at the door of Mr. Banbar, Agent John Anisiv, Agent Louis Napoli, Detective Louis Napoli, and Agent Nancy Floyd. I said, okay, I'm going home. But if the bomb got built on, get, get, get built and went off, don't come and knock on my door. That was November 1992. December came and I got bombarded by phone calls from the mosque in Queens by Mahmoud Abu Halima and other members of the cell to come to continue building the bombs. And I refused. I said, I'm scared of the FBI. They are monitoring me and surveilling me. And I pulled completely out of the cell. And that's at the time when Sheikh Omar reached out for Afghanistan, and I know how his communication to get around being traced. He was going to Osama bin Laden via fax machine in his bedroom in New Jersey because I saw that myself and requested another bomb builder. And that's when Ramzi Ahmad Yusuf came to the country with Ahmad Adda. Ramzi Ahmad Yusuf came to the country, took over building the bomb. And at that time, I assumed that the FBI continuously monitoring these people because I give them their names, I give, they have their pictures, they uh, 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 um, subpoenaed them, they have their fingerprints, they have the whole information. But unfortunately, they didn't follow up on them. Ramzi Ahmad Yusuf came, built the bomb, went off in 1993. I was in my front room watching TV, and then I hear that, there is a bomb went off in the World Trade Center. I called my wife. I said, honey, they... Okay, so there you have the story. Um, the FBI ordered the bomb to be exploded. So and the FBI is responsible for the deaths of the, during the 1993 Trade Center attack. Okay, now the next time that the government wanted to test the people and see what they could get away with, could they get away with destroying a building? Well, we didn't succeed in the 1993 bombing. Let's try it again. Maybe where? How about Oklahoma Federal Building, the Murrow, Murray, Murrow Building? Anyway, the Oklahoma City Federal Building. And, uh, yep, that was another FBI plot. Multiple bombs. We're going to play a 10-minute clip here to refresh your memories about that. The majority of people still believe that Timothy McVeigh was a right-wing extremist who bombed the Oklahoma City building with a rider truck because he was upset with the government. People close to the event told a very different story. A local congressman believes that convicted bomber Timothy McVeigh and his accused co-conspirator Terry Nichols are not the only ones involved. The Oklahoma State Representative Charles Key produced a videotape featuring witnesses who claim to have seen Timothy McVeigh with another man the morning of the bombing. He was wearing a ball cap. Timothy McVeigh had his on backwards, which just like this. It was on his head. The other gentleman had his on like this. In fact, the FBI had actively pursued John Doe No. 2 in its initial investigation, then denied his existence altogether. There were also multiple reports that explosives were found inside the Murrah building. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Bomb squads were actually caught on video, pulling into the building to retrieve these devices. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in 
and they will use that uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it. I just took a look down the street uh, at the Mara building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. This was even confirmed by the governor at the time, Frank Keating. One device was... Uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. Members of the ATF who would have normally been in the building were tipped off prior to the bombing. He saw what appeared to be a police bomb squad truck near the Murrah building two hours before the blast. It had a shield on the side of the door and it said bomb disposal or bomb squad blow it, and I really found that interesting. Another witness who spoke to ABC News on the condition of anonymity will tell the grand jury tomorrow he was told by an ATF official agents working in the building had been warned in advance not to come to work. He just came out and told me that the ATF wasn't in the building that day. They'd been tipped by their pagers not to come to work, uh, which I was, flabber I was flabbergasted. McVeigh would even claim in a letter written to his sister which was published by the New York Times, that he was actually recruited for black operations, which included smuggling drugs into the United States, as well as assassinations. One may brush this off as the ravings of a madman. However, McVeigh was filmed at the Camp Grafton Military Facility in North Dakota on August 3, 1993. McVeigh's official records state that he was discharged over a year prior from the Army Reserve in May of 1992. Perhaps even more interesting, is that Camp Grafton was specializing in training troops in explosives and demolitions at the time. When all was said and done, the security tapes reported to have captured the entire thing on video were rounded up and classified. In 2009, they were finally released, and magically none of them caught the bombing. The excuse being they were all having their tapes changed at that exact moment. This event would be labeled domestic extremism, which was used to demonize critics of world government, militias, and create fear within the populace. Muslim extremism seemed to show its ugly face in then unprecedented fashion on February 26, 1993. A truck bomb had gone off in the parking area of the World Trade Center. Luckily, the bombers failed to follow instructions and parked the truck carrying the explosives against the main support column. What is not discussed, however, is the bomb was actually built by an FBI informant under the supervision of the FBI. Ahmed Salam, a former Egyptian army officer, who had been doing undercover work for the FBI was the man who actually built the bomb. When he was told that he would have to use real bomb making material instead of harmless substitutes, he became suspicious and began taping his conversations with FBI officials. Last winter the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Notice the media emphasizes that they might have been able to stop it. They then gloss over the fact that the bomb was built by their agent under FBI supervision in conjunction with the district attorney. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. The actual recording where Salem discusses this with his FBI handler, John Antisev, was released years after the trial. You got paid regularly for, for good information. I mean, the expenses were a little bit out of the ordinary, and it was really questioned. Don't tell Nancy I told you this. But well, well, I have to tell her, of course. Well, then if you have to, you have to. Yeah, because, I mean, the lady was being honest, and I was being honest, and everything was submitted with a receipt. Yeah. I'm... And now it's questionable. It's not questionable. It's like a, a little out of ordinary. Okay. You know, the... all right. I don't think it was. If that's what you think, guys, fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. It was built by uh, 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 supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it. And we know that the bomb start to be built by who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Following the convictions of the Muslims who were too inept to make their own bomb and park the vehicle in the proper area, Salam was pulled into the FBI's witness protection program, 
where he has never been heard from again. Prior to the largest and most devastating terrorist attack on U.S. soil, the United States was poised as the first truly global superpower. Brzezinski would muse in 1997 that geostrategic success would represent a fitting legacy of America's role as the first, only, and last truly global superpower, and that the only way to mobilize Americans was a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. In September of 2000, a neoconservative think tank called the Project for a New American Century echoed Brzezinski's statements, saying the United States is the world's only superpower, combining preeminent military power, global technological leadership, and the world's largest economy. An engine for New World Order ideals, members of PNAC included Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Jeb Bush, Scooter Libby, William Crystal, and Paul Wolfowitz. Describing the difficulty in projecting force, they write the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. This takes us full circle to the September 11th attacks of 2001. In my previous film, Fabled Enemies, I expose in great detail the Saudi Arabian, Pakistani, and Israeli connections in conjunction with this international intelligence operation. In the early 1980s, bin Laden worked with operatives from U.S. intelligence, the Pakistani military, and Arab states. They ran a wide-ranging covert network that recruited and financed Muslim fighters to battle the Soviet army. The hijackers that were trained at U.S. military installations and protected by the FBI and CIA. The military exercises leading up to 9-11 and those that took place as the attacks occurred. Open line. Command, I'm Sergeant Richmond. Sergeant Richmond, turn away from Cheyenne Mountain Test Control. How are you? I'm doing fine. Okay, I need you to terminate all exercise inputs coming to Cheyenne Mountain at this time. Copy. And uh, stay on loop until I verify that you just were connectivity is disconnected on the exercise side only. Okay, no, do not do any more inputs on the exercise side and stand by. I got Cheyenne Mountain on the line. Terminating all exercise inputs. Coach Rover, if you didn't know this uh, exercise. Oh, yes. Yeah. The Black Ops Program, Able Danger, and the Shadow Government Involvement. This morning we learned that the Vice President wasn't the only one sent to an undisclosed location on September 11th, that an entire backup government was and is still there and may be there for as long as anyone now at least can imagine. As well as much, much more, the government has lied about 9-11 repeatedly and used it to dominate the Middle East while creating an evolving police state here encroaching on civil liberties at home. And of course, building a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. We know now that September 11th of 2001 was the beginning of what we might call a new world order. The new world order that uh, uh, this president's uh, father talked about with such great enthusiasm seems to be high on the agenda of this administration. Under the second Bush administration, massive amounts of civil liberties were openly and brazenly taken away following 9-11. The passage of the Patriot Acts, the Military Commissions Act, and other horrifying anti-constitutional legislation was enabled by the incredible amount of fear generated by the media, all in the name of keeping us safe here at home. The war itself would create huge profits for the military-industrial complex, and the globalists would seize even more power and control over Middle Eastern resources in what they planned to become a Eurasian Union under their control. Although the establishment claimed to be fighting for our freedom abroad, they were destroying our... I guess that... I guess that was the end real fast there. Uh, anyway, um, it seems that these uh, globalists sometimes uh, get thrown under the bus by other globalists. Um, have you been following the Epstein sex scandal? Uh, it, it's involving the British royalty. It involves the Clintons. In fact, uh, that's the interesting part. Who made it possible for the NSA to actually monitor every single thing you say on the phone? Well, in a kind of an indirect way, it was Bill Clinton.
he signed the 1996 uh, Anti-Terrorism Telecommunication Act, which made it a mandatory to uh, put those controls into the cell phones. It's interesting because uh, now it looks like he's hoist by his own petard, or did I get that right? Anyway, on his own petard. No, anyway, he's, uh, it's backfired on him. His own spying has brought him into the mix. We're going to play, this is an 11-minute clip that kind of explains how the Clintons are being brought in, probably to keep Hillary from uh, being part of the New World Order. We'll see what happens. But Some of the story of sex slaves, underage girls, a billionaire, murder, a prince, and at least one former U.S. president. What has been the biggest scandal in the U.K. since World War II has now come to the U.S., and it may involve former President Bill Clinton. The story surrounds this man, billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, who served time in 2008 for soliciting prostitution. That charge came as part of a plea deal. It all began in 2005 when Epstein was investigated after a woman reported that he paid her 14-year-old daughter $300 for sex. And since that initial claim, there have been more than 40 women who have come forward with claims that Epstein is a sexual predator and that he not only abused them, but shared them with famous and powerful friends. Well, flash forward to today, and a lawsuit is underway in Palm Beach, Florida. In that lawsuit, multiple mentions of former President Bill Clinton, who reportedly took multiple trips to Epstein's private island. You see it here. It's called Little St. James. It all happened between 2002 and 2005. Now, according to testimony in the lawsuit, at least one woman on that compound was there unwillingly. She is referred to as Jane Doe 102. She was forced to live as one of Epstein's underage sex slaves for years and was forced to have sex with politicians, businessmen, royalty, people working in academics, etc. Now, to be clear, in 2008, when the plea deal happened, Clinton cut off ties to Epstein, but maybe not. According to the UK Daily Mail, the lawsuit claims that Clinton was friends with an unnamed woman who kept images of naked, underage children on her computer, helped to recruit underage children for Epstein, and photographed underage females in sexually explicit poses. Now, while Clinton cut off ties with Epstein, this woman's abuses apparently did not end their relationship, as she was reportedly one of the 400 guests at Chelsea Clinton's 2010 wedding. So what did Bill Clinton know? What was he a part of? According to the smoking gun, as part of a civil suit filed against Epstein by several of his victims, lawyers for the women floated the possibility of subpoenaing Clinton, since he might well be a source of relevant information about Epstein's activities. Now, while Clinton was never deposed, lawyers obtained Epstein's computerized phone directory, which included email addresses for Clinton, along with 21 phone numbers for him including those for his assistant, Doug Band, according to a court filing. Now, I spoke earlier with Dennis Hoff, the owner of the Bunny Ranch in Nevada, and a man who personally knows Bill Clinton. In fact, Hoff photographed Clinton with two of his Bunny Ranch girls at a charity event in Los Angeles in March of last year. I asked Hoff if with multiple trips to Little St. John Island, if there is any way that Bill Clinton was not aware of these underage girls. I don't believe it's possible. It, it's amazing that this happened and, and came to light. Uh, and I don't think Bill Clinton would ever want to be involved with an underage girl. But the fact that it's happening in front of his eyes and that the Secret Service guys uh, didn't do something about it is shocking. 21 phone numbers as well as email addresses uh, that were reportedly belonged to him that were uh, in possession of Jeffrey Epstein. What does that say to you? Well, it says it says that, that this Epstein is just an absolute disgusting pig. I mean, to be messing around with underage girls, it, it's just unbelievable. Now, I, I give Bill Clinton uh, a, a little bit of a pass because, look, he had other parties after this all happened. And who went to it? Stephanopoulos, Katie Couric. Woody Allen, which is not a, not a good sign, I guess, uh, and Chelsea Handler. Uh, so it could be possible that, he, that Clinton did not know about this, but it's almost hard to believe. 
And that party that Hoff mentions there was just one party as compared to the multiple visits by Bill Clinton. But this story is much bigger than just former President Clinton. Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, is being connected to this scandal as well. In 2001, Virginia Roberts, a 17-year-old who now claims to have been held as Epstein's sex slave, was introduced to Prince Andrew while staying at a London home. Ms. Roberts claims that she was paid £10,000 as a reward for having sex with Prince Andrew by Epstein. I spoke earlier with RT UK presenter Afshin Ratanzi, and he says that the scandal around Prince Andrew is growing daily. It is definitely building in the uh, infamous British tabloid press who are uh, kind of at war with the royal family uh, in as the general election campaign here proper begins. It is a kind of old story, but of course we are getting further facts because of the uh, plaintiff in effect. Now in the UK, this story though is a lot larger than just Jeffrey Epstein and Prince Andrew. In fact, it seems like it involves this pedophilia ring that reaches into the highest levels of uh, British society, including presenters with the BBC, including uh, members of parliament. It's it seems like this is a growing story that involves some 1,400 kids. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that and the development over the last year into that story? Yeah, around the world, the headlines from Britain tend to, uh, in the international newspapers, seem to make out that Britain is this uh, center of upper-class pedophilia. And uh, indeed, the press here also reflecting uh, those stories. There is a certain degree of frenzy about it, it has, has to be said, but at the same time, the story keeps giving because uh, the latest, uh, quite apart from the fact that there have been entertainers jailed, quite apart from the fact that uh, close confidants of the powerful uh, have been jailed, uh, top public relations people and so on, now the story seems to be concerning not only uh, paedophile rings, but actually murder, and murder so close to the Palace of Westminster itself, the, the so-called Mother of Parliaments. So these cases are ongoing. And, and can you, uh, can you define for, me, for us the murder charge? That, that goes back to a, a young man who was believed to have died during one of these orgies, is that correct? That's right. There's testimony uh, that's now being investigated uh, as to whether uh, they rent boys, I suppose, uh, the murder of rent boys by prominent politicians with people being named. But I think it's very important to emphasize the fact that uh, all the accusations tend to be on people who've died. It's as if the, uh, uh, the police and the Scotland Yard has its own headlines as regards covering up things in this country. Uh, it's so scandalous that even the government here, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, has been criticizing the police federation uh, for the past year or so. And we know that Scotland Yard has been involved in cover-up after cover-up relating to so many different aspects of British civic, civic life. So uh, as regards current serving politicians, every time it it uh, seems to touch uh, a serving British politician. It, the story seems to dwindle, and again we talk about stories of uh, past ministers, particularly in Margaret Thatcher's cabinet uh, during the 1980s. Well, as the story grows, it becomes more and more apparent this is not just the story of underage girls. It is the story of a massive pedophilia ring involving some of the most powerful people in the world. Back to Jeffrey Epstein, because when police were investigating Epstein in 2008, they found an Amazon.com invoice for the purchase of sex slave books, such as Slavecraft, Roadmaps for Erotic Servitude, Principles, Skills, and Tools. Another called Training with Ms. Abernathy, a workbook for erotic slaves and their owners. And SM101, a realistic introduction. I spoke with Cambys Shambankari, who has spent years covering sex trafficking all around the world, and I asked him what this scandal is demonstrating about the power and the abuse of people from around the world. Uh, you know, the fact is, uh, regardless of, of what's happening right now with Princess War, uh, Andrew and Epstein, uh, you know, that's a long time that uh, a community of wealthy people, they take advantage of underage uh, children and girls especially. Uh, you know, uh, there was, uh, based on United States uh, government document, there were more than 600,000 cases of uh, uh, human trafficking that more than 60% of them, they were girls that they brought to United States. Uh, Thailand has a, one of the worst cases in this matter that 
many rich people they travel to Thailand to have sex with under eight children and uh, in this case for uh, for Miss Roberts case she was 17 but we are facing in Thailand with something like six years old or five years old kids that they have been used as a sex slaves well, and it's just, it just seems like this is, um, and as you pointed out, and I think you make a great point, that at the end of the day, um, a lot of the girls who are involved in this particular story, and that's not to minimize the abuse of them, uh, are much older. And yet there are very young children all around the world that this is happening to, even as we're speaking. Yeah, that, that's true. But, but what, what is bothering me about this case is uh, blaming the victim. That, that's, that we, we see a lot, you know. How so? How uh, are they blaming the victim? Uh, they, they started to bullying the, uh, this woman. When you say that, are you talking specifically about Alan Dershowitz, the attorney who's now been assigned to this case, now taking it exactly. on? Exactly. And she's, a, she's a, you know, uh, Miss Roberts is, is an example of many of those victims that they, they can't s step forward. They can't talk about their abusers. They can't talk about what happened to them because uh, they are afraid. Well, that person who is now blaming the victims, as you heard there, according to Shambankari, is attorney Alan Dershowitz, who himself has now been accused of having sex with underage girls associated with Epstein. Writing in the Wall Street Journal Law Blog that he is the victim of an extortion conspiracy, Dershowitz is calling for the disbarment of the two lawyers who are representing the alleged victims. It's a story we'll continue to follow. <laughs> How's that for a story really involved? If you like gossip, this is... That's your story, I'll tell you. But um, it's, it is very serious because this is something that's specifically designed to, uh, well, embarrass. Now, of course, the uh, pedophilia, people like Alex Jones and others have been exposing that for years and years and years. And they just look at them and say, you're crazy. The, the Queen of England and the royal family and all that involved in pedophilia and incest and... Have, they have relatives that are, you know, from from the continual incest that the family does. They have, uh, you know, mental problems and have to be continually uh, monitored and by professionals. Um, well, okay, we've got more stuff going on. We only have about six minutes left. I'm going to play a little short video here. This is uh, a Russia Today video. The same guy, Ben Swan, uh, that we just saw is going to... Um, explain about the uh, Palestinian bid for membership in the International Criminal Court with the purpose of charging Israel with crimes and keep in mind that you know that's kind of ex post facto you don't get to charge for cr charge crimes that happened before you joined supposedly well, it may maybe they'll let them but if they don't the next time Israel does another one of their war crime atrocities they're going to be in a little bit more trouble. So let's let's go ahead and take a look at this and we'll be back in about two and a half minutes. Israel has said it will withhold tax revenues and will bring war crime lawsuits against Palestinian leaders. It follows Palestinian attempts to join the International Criminal Court after a vote on the latest resolution on an Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories failed in the UN Security Council, falling short by a single vote. Let's bring in Paula Salia now for more details from Tel Aviv. The very latest on this, it would seem, Paula, that Israel is now even more infuriated by uh, Palestine's latest moves. Well, it certainly does seem that way. The latest word from Israeli officials is that they're threatening to freeze more than $127 million in tax revenue that the Palestinian government receives on a monthly basis to help it run its affairs. The Israeli government is also threatening to bring before the dock Palestinian officials and accuse them of war crimes. This follows the Palestinian statehood bid and also the most recent efforts by Palestinian officials to join the International Criminal Court and other global organizations organizations. Now, the Palestinians say that these harsh moves by the Israelis merely justify their position. On Tuesday, the United Nations Security Council rejected the Palestinian statehood bid. This called for Israel to withdraw from the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem and for an independent Palestinian state to be established by late 2017. Nine out of 15 votes were required. Only eight were actually achieved. 
These included Jordan, which introduced the motion, as well as China, Russia, France and Luxembourg. Among the countries who abstained were a few surprises because these are countries that very often show fidelity to the United States, and they include Nigeria, Rwanda, South Korea, Lithuania and the United Kingdom. And then, of course, those who voted against it were both Australia and the United States. Now, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations has said that this shows the monopoly of the United States, he called it a strategic mistake. At the same time, the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations has submitted documents to join the International Criminal Court, and this would ultimately enable Palestinians to take the Israelis to court on charges of war crimes. All right, Artis Polisley, they're live in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Okay, now it's kind of an interesting thing the way that worked out. Um, We'll have to keep our eye on that and see if, you know, there's anything that can be done. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, we'll have to see if anything can be done to rein in the uh, savage Israeli uh, war machine. Um, keep in mind, they're just as bad as we are, and we're the worst in the world. So, I mean, we violate the most civil rights. We, we kill more innocent people. We invade more sovereign countries without cause, I mean, without legitimate cause. There's always a cause. That cause is greed. You know, people like Dick Cheney running Halliburton, you know, that type of greed. It's, it's absolutely insane greed. Greed that will they'd rather destroy the planet while making a profit. Doesn't matter. Okay, well, we're going to play one clip as we go out. This is about the, uh, uh, oh, I spaced out on it. Oh, shit. Mind fade. Somebody tell me what's going on. Okay, just just play it and we'll go out on it. Uh, oh, yeah. Anyway. Go ahead. The U.S. slapped a fresh round of sanctions on North Korea over its alleged involvement in the hacking of Sony Pictures. Pyongyang denies having a hand in November's cyber attack. The U.S. latest penalties target several top North Korean officials and organizations. Last month, the FBI claimed it has enough evidence to implicate Pyongyang in the hack that revealed embarrassing e emails and Hollywood stars' private data. Cyber criminals also threatened the company with terror attacks, leading Sony to postpone the release of a satirical film ridiculing the North Korean leader. It's the first time in history the U.S. has sanctioned a nation in response to a cyber attack. Earlier, we were joined by Lawrence Freeman from the Executive Intelligence Review, who thinks that the president could lead the U.S. into another war. Many people in the cyber community, intelligence community, and the IT community uh, say that there is no proof that the North Korean government carried out this cyber attack. And the danger is that President Obama is making these threats, uh, now he's going ahead with sanctions, and there's a danger that this president, if he's not brought under control, could force us into a war, and uh, therefore we have to uh, control him as soon as possible. We should be very careful to realize that this is not simply a problem of North Korea. War is an alternative to actually dealing with the problems of the economy and the financial system. And that's what we've seen in the past, and that's what we're seeing again. No, uh, those behind yeah, okay, North Korea and South Korea are supposed to be unified this year, and I think they're trying to start a war to prevent that. Anyway, we'll see you next Saturday, and uh, I'll try to be a little bit uh, more informative on this subject.